Um, and by the way, usually, usually what I do, so it's seven. Um, what I like to do is um, kind of give people a little bit of time to filter in, if that's okay, David. Um, mm -hmm. It's okay. <clears throat> All right, wonderful. We already have a lot of people. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give a, a maybe like two minutes or so, two or three minutes, just kind of as people filter in. Um, but you're all in the right place. Uh, welcome to you all, and we'll just get we'll get started in just a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, before I forget, I'm actually going to ask just anybody uh, out there a favor. Um, if somebody could just put a hello in the Q&A chat box there, I just want to make sure that before we kind of get into it, I just want to make sure it's working and that I can see. Hey, oh, I love it. Thank you so much. That's awesome. A lot of people. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Wonderful. Appreciate that. So we'll get started in just another uh, minute or so. <clears throat> what are you drinking, David? What do you got? Tea? Yeah, as a good Englishman, cup of tea. Fantastic. How about you? Uh, I'm, I'm being a good New Englander. I've got my uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, coffee. <laughs> we each their own. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of slowly get started. Um, we have a lot of people already uh, joining us. So Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, my name is Arto Vaughn. I'm the executive director of Project Save Photograph Archives located in the Boston area. Um, Project Save, I'm just gonna say a few quick words about Project Save and we'll get right into uh, uh, our wonderful event today. Um, Project Save um, is the oldest, largest and only uh, archive that is solely dedicated to photographs from the Armenian global experience. Um, we uh, it was founded uh, un unofficially in the in the late 1960s by our founder Ruth Tomasian. Um, she she got very interested in in uh, photography more seriously while she was living in New York City. In 1975, Project Save officially became a 501c3 nonprofit. And now, uh, almost 50 years later, um, not only uh, is it the only such archive in the Armenian world, but um, we now are one of the really unique and important photography archives in all of North America. Um, at this point, we have over 80,000 uh, hard copy original uh, photographs uh, that in one way or the other connect to the Armenian experience uh, from all over the world. Um, so uh, we we thank you very much uh, for joining us. These and I do want to say um, 
these events, these conversations in photography that that I and my my staff launched, um, I guess a year ago now, um, they've been very very successful. Um, we've uh, not only with reconnecting with our uh, dedicated uh, base of supporters, but um, we've drawn so many new folks that it really don't didn't know about Project Save at all or didn't know that much about it. A lot of non-Armenian uh, folks. So so we are very appreciative of that. And, and I do want to say, especially today, um, we've broken a record. We tend to get really good turnout uh, for these events. But I have to say today is, is particularly special because I was telling um, uh, David Lowe, our speaker, and um, I was telling my friend um, Mark Mamagonian, who I also want to thank the Director of Academic Affairs from Nasser, um, who are our co-sponsors for, for today's conversations on photography. We have well over 220 or 230, I've lost count, but it's well over 200 people registered for this event tonight. Um, and that breaks our record by around, I don't know, 50 people, something like that. So thank you all very much. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker for this evening. The way the format will work is um, once I turn it over to Dr. Lowe, uh, he'll present. Uh, when when he wraps up his presentation, uh, I will moderate the conversation. I'll also at that point uh, invite uh, Mark uh, Mamigonian to also join so the three of us can have a discussion. And I would suggest that for all of you, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, box. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen there. It'll say Q&A. Uh, if you have a question um, after uh, David's presentation, you can start putting your questions there and I'll integrate them into our conversation. Um, I'm very excited uh, to have uh, Dr. David Lowe with us this evening. Uh, David is a photographic historian specializing in the photography of the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Armenian world and the wider intersections between photography, migration, and exile. Um, he received his PhD from the Courtauld Institute of Art, University of London. And uh, his recent book, which, which I highly recommend, uh, it's called Picturing the Ottoman Armenian World, Photography in Erzurum, Harput, Van, and Beyond. Uh, that was published in 2022 by I.B. Taurus. It's, it's a wonderful book. Very, very pleased to, to welcome David. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Otto. And hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure and great privilege to uh, be with you this evening. I'm really happy to be um, here for this event hosted by Project Save and NASA. Um, Project Save, I just um, was just thinking, I've been going to Project Save for um, well over 10 years now, and it is a really um, unique and special place. And with a marvelous, marvelous collection. And I, I lent on Project Save um, quite a bit during my research. Um, the staff there have been wonderful and um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to now be um, now be speaking for them and also NASA, um, who also have a very, a very lovely photographic collection. I've also used their pictures and um, also to thank NASA for their support and to thank Mark Mangoni in particular for the sport and the interest in my work he's shown over the years. Um, so in keeping with that, the photographs that I'll be using and showing you this evening um, are mostly from those collections, um, almost derived entirely from Project Statement and NASA collections. Um, and the few exceptions to that come from the APCFM archive at um, Harvard University, so it's actually the, the American Missionary Archive. So everything you see tonight can be found in Massachusetts. And that's no coincidence at all. There's good reason for that. It says something about the excellent work that has been done to bring photographs together and to preserve them in Massachusetts. Um, but it also speaks of a particular relationship. As you probably, many of you know, Massachusetts was a favorite destination for Armenian migrants, and a good number of them came from Harper province. So this is about a particular relationship um, between two places and one that, one in which photographs featured very heavily. So this is, I feel, an apt subject for tonight, and also, I hope, uh, apt for a series entitled Conversations on Photography, 
what we're dealing with is conversations across the world that once took place through pictures. And also I'd like to think about conversations today, the conversations we might have about photographs and indeed the conversations we might have with photographs. So, excellent. There's always a moment of terror where I have to um, operate technology in front of people. <laughs> it looks good, David. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's lovely to have that that reassurance. There you go. <laughs> So I begin on the Harpert Plain, the Golden Plain, with a little bit of background and context. Um, Harpert Province, a place dominated by agriculture and a strong local textile industry. Uh, Zeno Keza uses the chief local product as a powerful motif, silk, tying the region together and connecting it to the outside world. Historically, despite its position on trade routes, its weak regional infrastructure and relative isolation in the mountainous interior kept the Harpert Plain poor. However, as the 19th century progressed, new roads improved regional links to Harpert. So too did they link Harpert to the ports of Trebizond on the Black Sea and Messin on the Mediterranean and their steamship uh, lines to Europe. In an era of heightened connectivity, a powerful foreign presence grew in Harpert, particularly in the form of French, German, and American missionaries, the latter being the presence most keenly felt. Um, so just to, this is Harpert Plain looking northwards, just to situate us geographically. Up here is Harpert City, the upper city, and down below the plain, just the left is Musra, which was the, the lower city, it was the new city that had developed um, through the 19th century. And over here, the town of Husseinik, Husseinik which um, becomes quite important for our story. So the substantial foreign presence in Harper gave the place a level of cosmopolitanism that was unusual for the region and came to exert a powerful influence on the province. Perhaps most noteworthy um, was the American presence, of course, and this is a photograph from the ABCM archives with, uh, it's been annotated showing the upper city the American missionary buildings have helpfully been numbered for us. So just a quick look at the landscape there shows us just what a, uh, a strong American presence there was there. Um, but perhaps more important than the arrival of foreigners in Harput was uh, a corresponding departure, the departure of local Armenians. The foreign presence um, in Harput aroused among local Armenians an interest in uh, foreign lands, particularly in the USA, and open up opportunities for them to travel and work there. The ultimate center of the American missionary network was Massachusetts. That place, along with other industrial centers of North America, called to Harpet Seas with the lure of economic opportunities. What began in the late 1860s with a small number of individuals often pursuing business interests developed into a larger movement involving those from the less well-off classes in the late 1870s, an exodus that continued to expand as the 19th century headed towards its close. Some of the first arrivals traveled directly along the strands of the missionary network. The first Armenian Worcester was uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, arrived in 1877 with the missionary George Cushing Knapp. Um, and he stayed in the town for employment because the town was uh, an industrial as well as missionary center. He worked in the wire mill and his letters home, detailing the high wages on offer in American industry, gave rise to a stream of other Armenian migrants following in his wake. Fire became a new thread in the lives uh, of Armenian migrants, but the old threads remained as well with migrants also finding employment in the textile mills of the region, as well as um, other factories. 
It might have been the presence of, a, uh, of American missionaries that first created the link between Harper and the USA, but once the link was forged, it was largely self-sustaining. The solidification of Armenian communities in North America prompted but more migrants, as did the weakening of Armenian communities in the homelands. Um, now, just to go quickly back here, um, actually few Armenian communities remained untouched by what was known at the time as uh, American fever, but Harput province was um, uh, a place where this, this fever took particular hold and uh, experienced a sizable exodus. The town of Husseinig that um, I was referring to showed itself early on to be an especially strong provider of migratory labor. Of its 3,500 residents in 1888, 200 were away in the USA. From the first decade of the 20th century, the American consulate in Mazra can be found estimating that approximately 80% of the Armenians migrating to the USA had their orange, uh, origins in Harput. So this was a mass migratory movement that came in no small way to define the province and reshape the lives of its citizens. So a close examination of uh, this photograph here, a photograph of a bakery in Harpert, the upper city, um, shows some of the ways in which Harpert was opened up to other worlds. It's one of many photographs taken by um, visiting American missionaries, um, and we can consider it a document of uh, the locals being studied by um, the visiting foreigners, but we could just as well reverse that equation and think of it as well, this is how this is um, the local Armenians studying the visiting Americans. Um, and it tells us of how uh, Americans and other foreigners became basically a daily presence in the lives of um, the, uh, the citizens of Harput. And while the human presen uh, presence of missionaries had a huge bearing on developments in the province, this photograph also speaks um, of an imaginative, a visual presence and an imaginative presence. Indeed, uh, as we study the details of the picture, we find just here um, what is pinned to the wall, seemingly pages uh, from the American illustrated from American illustrated magazines. Uh, and it becomes a, uh, an image about the circulation of images. Settling in new lands, migrants would send home postcards and newspaper pictures of their new lands, pictures which were then studied at length by friends and family and which uh, fixed onto walls such as those in the bakery became a natural physical part of Harper Province. They're basically portals through which the other side of the world could be glimpsed and uh, with which the far away could maintain a daily presence in the lives of Harper seeds. Um, now, unfortunately, it's, I think it's a bit cut off here, so I'm going to go back to there is there is a beautiful detail here which we can't quite see. The caption here is "City of Glass and Steel," um, which to me is a, sort of an amazing encapsulation of what uh, America must have seemed to. Uh, Harpet sees uh, this sort of golden promised land of, of uh, technical marvels and economic opportunity. So migrants sent home photographs uh, of their new lands, but they sent home chiefly photographs of themselves, carefully composed to project a certain image of their lives. They were in part progress reports. They confirmed the migrants safe arrival and perhaps more importantly, proceeded to speak of their uh, arrival, their attainment in social and economic terms. Um, and I'm showing you here a portrait of Krikor Krikorian uh, of Husseinik, who um, was, uh, he studied at the famous American Missionary College in Hartford. Euphrates College, as it's chiefly known. It was still called Armenia College, its old name. Uh, when Krikor Krikorian graduated from there. In 1882, he migrated from his hometown of Husseinik to, um, to Worcester, Massachusetts. And you, it's a, 
it's a wonderful picture. You can I'm going to use that word wonderful a lot. A lot of these are, are yeah, favorite pictures of mine. Um, you can really see the uh, the sort of the status symbols on display here, and how this would have seemed to uh, an Armenian of Hartford studying it uh, in the surroundings of Hartford to, to see Krikor Krikorian in suit, cravat, gloves, watch chain, cane. It um, it altogether presents quite a, a refined and opulent image, I would say. Now. At the same time, as much was put on display, much was left, we might say, out of the frame. The often difficult conditions under which migrants lived and worked. And we might think symbolically of something's been erased from Krikor Krikorin's photograph here. I, I believe this is just for a later publication purposes, but um, and as much as I try to stay away from symbolic readings of photographs, this, um, this to me, it stands as a sort of symbol of the way in which Migrants' images were refined and a, a certain um, carefully considered idealized image was then sent home to, to friends and family and community that stayed behind. Um, but these weren't, uh, in many cases, in most cases, it sounds a bit like they're calculated lives, but they are simply what we all do with pictures. We we tend to present our, our best selves and particularly there's a line of thought that about migrant photography, how migrants settling in their new lands in, in strange um, foreign climates uh, tend to go to the studio and tend to um, look their best and have these what have been called visions of the future. They imagine a future successful self where they've um they've settled successfully where they've um uh, achieved and have become successful now echoing those letters from Worcester's first armenian migrant studio portraits essentially put tales of high wages into visual form offering their own siren song to potential migrants back home like the City of Glass and Steel newspaper image I was just referring to, their portraits spoke of magnificence and opulence. Indeed, migrants must have appeared in those photographs to be themselves denizens of the City of Glass and Steel, even its human embodiments. They themselves became the economic lure, advertisements for the USA that implicated photography and migration, tempting others to join the Western movement. Now, all photographs, in a sense, are incomplete with something left out, or they have some sort of um, invisible element. Often, it's, often what's missing is simply a part of the narrative, the personal story that makes sense of a photograph. Um, photographers in the region were very, very talented, uh, creative, people who really had talents that were, were yeah, quite rare in the region. And yet at the same time, photography was an industrial product. So what we're dealing with is often the repetition of set, uh, set patterns, set tropes, set poses. Um, this is essentially the reason why often photographs can blur into one another and if you look at a lot of photographs you begin to see the repetitions and they all sort of look the same and in many ways they are they are the same there's little to differentiate them until you think about how each one has its own unique circumstances and to make sense of pictures you often need to place them in their particular circumstances and their particular contexts this one for example, could be really any family photograph. Um, and yet we learn, if things take on a different complexion, when we learn that Mugradich, the sun on the side of the picture here, is basically on the verge of, uh, he's uh, just about to depart for the USA. This is the final family photograph uh, taken of everyone together before he departs. And now that we, once we know that, he actually, he looks quite different. He really looks like he's just about to walk through the door and head off to um, the steamship and begin his 
his journey. Uh, this became uh, almost a ritual for families to photograph themselves together before, before departure. Um, and the photograph, in essence, does several things. Well, it moves in two directions. It, it's a picture of completeness. Um, and it allows Mogadic essentially to stay behind with his family. He leaves a, vis uh, a, a visual vestige of himself behind with his family. And meanwhile, he can also take this photograph, another print of this photograph, away with himself. And he, his family, despite staying behind in Hartford, can travel with him to the USA. Also, he can take this photograph. We also learn by studying the history of the family that there is another brother, his elder brother, Harry, who's already in the United States. So he's also carrying a picture of the family to his brother who would not have seen them for many years. Um, and this also tells us a little, it tells us something about the, uh, the flow of people. Brothers tended to uh, follow, uh, younger brothers followed elder brothers, sons followed their fathers. And often I'll talk about migrants I will refer to them as he in uh, as men, and essentially most of them were men, young men of working age. Um, and it also tells you something about the flow of pictures. Sometimes they're entrusted to the post, but more often pictures travelled with people. When people travelled, they would uh, take pictures with them. They may pack existing pictures, or often they would. Um, the actual departure would be the, uh, the impetus would be that moment to actually take a picture and have um, something to travel with, something to accompany you and something to take to those people, those friends, those families you are joining on the other side of the world. And Again, some repetitions. This photograph is essentially laid out in a very similar form. It's a very similar family picture. We have uh, on the right hand side the eldest son, uh, who, just like this eldest son, is not quite the eldest son, but the second son. Um, the eldest son we actually see in photographic form. This is the Kubatian family of Hussein. Um, and here we have um, the eldest son, Makar, who had been in uh, Worcester since 1901. I think this is uh, 1907, this photograph. So for the past six years, Makar had been in Worcester. And before that time, his father, Havan, uh, sorry, Havanus, had been in uh, Worcester. So the father is now back in, um, in Husseini and the son has followed in his footsteps. Again, it tells you a little something about movement and the way in which quite often uh, these were imagined as temporary migrations. Um, men leaving for the US did not think of themselves as leaving for good. Often they were going to stay to work for a few years, to send money home, to make some money, and then return to the homeland. And often there'd be a a succession, you know, of such as here with the, the father returning and then the son going out. Uh, it tells us something really interesting about these photographic conversations, these back and forths. This photograph has arrived from Worcester. You can even see the envelope, how it would have, uh, how it would have got them, quite possibly with a, a letter inside as well, and that was poking out of this envelope is this studio portrait. Um, so essentially, uh, the Kabatian family then, you know, Makar is sending them a portrait, so they have a picture of, of him, and then the, the, the Kabatians reply, the family reply in turn by having their portrait taken. And with their picture, they do something similar to what, the, uh, what their son has done. They provide a likeness of themselves so that they might have visual and physical presence in his life. And then they hold up his picture almost in demonstration of the fact that this is what his picture does for them. 
it makes him present in their lives. And by holding it up, they tell him something as well, that he is loved, that he is missed, that although absent, he is a part of the family still. And it's the, we, we find several pictures laid out like this with the portrait of the migrant included in the family photograph. They are really touching, uh, complex, contradictory images at once about separation and togetherness, that desire to, to combat separation by any, any means necessary. And the photograph um, is one of the ways in which the family stays together. This is also is a very interesting uh, example of this, this photographic conversation, the back and forth. Um, we have Anna um, Azarumian of in Harput and her betrothed uh, Azuman Sarabian, who is was at the time in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. So essentially we have some studio portraits going, almost crossing each other over the ocean. Um, each one I would imagine designed um, for the other recipient as it were. Um, it tells you something again about, about photography and about photography as an industrial product. This pose of the, the resting elbow is something we see all the time. We see it here, a car with the resting elbow. It becomes something quite uh, particular in Armenian photographs. The resting elbow uh, or the resting hand is often about family connections. It's about demonstrating closeness. Um, but it is uh, basically a pose we see repeated across the world in photographs from many different places. Um, and so here you see photographs made thousands of miles apart, which uh, essentially mirror one another. And they then, by some enterprising photographer uh, in Rhode Island, uh, have been forged together as a, as a sort of composite picture, a, almost a sort of um, a, a, a wedding portrait almost. And the photographer has made a virtue of these, of this mirroring, these resting elbows, which he then links together, almost as if the two are arm in arm, perhaps uh, walking down the aisle. Um, it, 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 with this photography demonstrates the work that it does in support of uh, long distance relationships. More than that, however, this quasi-matrimonial uh, quasi stance creates a vision that foretells and actually instrumentally plays a role in bringing about a future joining. The, the photograph is one of the ways in which this couple, is, this couple essentially stay together. And then again, delving into the actual history of this couple, we find Anna actually following her photograph, traveling along the lines of her photograph and herself moving to the USA in um, 1907 making the westward journey and actually the couple were getting married shortly after uh, arrival. So this is where, yes, often it is the men of working age who are the migrants, but through um, either marriages arranged through pictures or through um, relationships sustained through pictures, women join the working men as well um, to, um, uh, further augment these diasporic communities in the United States. Photographs forge relationships and forge physical passages across the world. Women followed their portraits and followed the lines of relationships fostered and sustained through those photographs, um, as did others. Interesting enough, again, thinking about the delving into the family history. Um, I think I can't, uh, I'm almost 100% positive now that um, when Anna moves to the United States in 1907, we find her on a ship called the Korean, which sails in September, I'm just thinking, September 1907 from Liverpool uh, in the UK 
to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And on that same ship, we find the Kubatian family of Hussein Nick. So uh, a coincidence there, and amazingly, it looks like this family followed their picture pretty soon after they would have, they traveled in 1907 and this photograph is taken in 1907. So they were not far behind this photograph. It adds another dimension to the photograph as if to say, All the things we you are missed, you are loved, you are part of the family, but also perhaps we are on our way. We this is a little missive to say we will be with you soon, and it might add another dimension to this envelope as well, as if it was the, the their passage to the end of Worcester with Makar, the son, and um, their passage was paid for by him. So possibly this envelope from Makar uh, details in some way or has something to do with that journey that they are soon to make. So we are now dealing with another kind of migration. Uh, these young men of working age um, that were there for their temporary stays are, are one thing, but now with families moving this speaks of something more permanent. Um, and well, here we are back. I use this photograph to begin with to lay out the geography of the province. Um, but now we might look at the ostensible, the, the actual, the purpose behind the picture. Um, Harpet C photographers uh, made studio portraits of the, the families that have been left behind, but they also um, photographed the land as well. They photographed um, various local groups and institutions. This is actually a local orphanage. Um, I can't date this picture, but we do know that orphanages in Harpet, um, well, they particularly grew uh, in the wake of the massacres of the 1890s. So without knowing for sure, this could be a group of orphans, um, uh, a group of children orphaned in those massacres, which tells us a little something about migration. We're not simply dealing with uh, economic migration, but um, there are often a number of factors involved and it's often difficult to extricate these different things to, to um, the, the quest for prosperity for Armenians is also often wrapped up with the quest for safety and security. Safety and security that were really becoming uh, all too rare. So this photograph of um, orphans was designed for those um, diasporic Armenians. Basically, it was a photograph to raise, fund, raise funds for local orphanage groups. So what we find is that uh, Armenian communities in the United States, they grow and they become more solid and they become more permanent, but they keep their links. Again, keeping their links in part through photographs and through um, through sending money back. It seems like churches and uh, schools are main recipients of these um, of migrant the the, uh, the rewards of migrant labour. Um, we're in Husseinik now. This is Serp Baba Church in Husseinik, one of the largest. Uh, churches on the Golden Plain. Um, we know that this was a church, a church that benefited from uh, migrant labor. One particular in, uh, instance is 1888 when the Hussein Hussein Armenians um, paid for uh, a new bell for the church and had it forged in the United States. And the new bell was was uh, shipped over back home. Um, so we have the church here. Next door, the boys school attached to the church. And if I go off on a little tangent, one of the things I love about this picture is the, the way we can situate it in a particular place, Husseinig, 
we can uh, situate it basically the photographers a and h sensorian um are photographing the church and the boys school where they're standing on the parapet of the girls school that was opposite the church in fact we can see the church right here so they're basically photographing from here here they're looking westwards we can situate them in this particular place they themselves were residents of the town they lived in the western part of the town just there and helpfully it's been dated 15th of october 1907 so we can situate it in a very particular place and a very particular specific place and a specific moment um and so there is something autobiograph uh, autobiographical about the picture as well um and if we go to the, the school next door, what we find is some of these details are wonderful. It's, it's to me there's um, a lot here simply about the joy of the joy of pictures, the joy of having a photograph taken. The, all these uh, kids essentially craning to to get into the shot and to uh, make sure they're included in the picture. They're also holding out their school books. A lot of them do this as if it's actually something orchestrated and we find out that the um, sensorians were uh, members of the what was called the library committee of the town so they essentially raised funds for the purchase of books for the school uh, and books that were used by the wider community as well so again showing their school books um, it's it's supposition but i do think this picture might might be about their own personal projects um, a picture used to raise funds to purchase, um, raise funds from the diaspora to uh, purchase books for the school children and for the local community. And again, supposition, but I don't think it's too far fetched to think about this. This child at the end waving always gets me. I. I do think he, he must on some level understand that what he's doing by having his photograph taken by waving is he's in touch with Armenians on the other side of the world. That this is what the photograph, this is what the camera, the opportunity the camera provides is this connection, as I say, this portal between worlds which connects Armenians living in different places. This is his, his wave across the world. I, I, I quickly, this is a bit of a, another tangent, um, but what I love about pictures also is the way they keep on revealing something extra. And it was actually um, when I was getting these scans from NASA and Mark Mamgonian was, uh, was scanning, was very kindly scanning them for me, that he um, came up with the idea that possibly these are two, actually two photographs stitched together. And sure enough, I, I must have looked at this photograph a hundred times. And it always looked like a picture of two halves, but I never actually considered it a composite picture. But sure enough, we look closely. We see the join line in the middle. The bricks don't quite align. There's been a lot of um, ink work done to try and match up the tones. These little details that say, uh, the more we look at pictures, the more they reveal of themselves, but also the more questions they, they pose as well. Uh, this is another wonderful picture by um, uh, Hovannis and Madara Sosorian. Uh, these are the elder generation of Sosorians, the first Sosorians, um, the first photographers in Harper province. They did a lot of they took a lot of commissions for uh, the American missionaries um, with these photographs basically serving purpose of progress reports to be sent to headquarters the regional headquarters in Constantinople and the uh, the ultimate headquarters back in Massachusetts and also photographs for uh, sponsors to see the good work being done by the um, by the missionaries and their schools. Um, I love the way that 
the, phot the photographers have essentially, they've used the shape of the city on the hill to communicate their purpose, which is about um, this school group here, the girls' school. Um, school photography is always about elevation. It's about improving children, children's lives. And here it's quite literal. They use the city and they they bring they raise the school children above the city and some again what I love about photography is these incidental details. These are some people down below who've stopped to watch the work and actually to be captured in the photograph. Um, so that actually serves the photographer's purpose of elevation. It is thanks to American schooling. This photograph is saying it has raised up this class. It has improved their lives, and it does this in even in an even better way. There's a, a note on the back saying the figure at the top is the top student in the class. So one student has been put above the rest, so she can look down on her peers as the star pupil. But again, there's always something. There's always something random. Um, as talented as photographers were and as carefully considered as their photographs are, they are also at the whims of the wider world. Um, there's this, well, this child who's basically inveigled his way into the, the shot, pretty much uh, making a mockery of the whole thing and, and <laughs> ruining it for perhaps for the photographer and the photograph group. So this star pupil could well be looking down at her classmates, or she may well be looking at this kid, saying, how dare you, how dare you ruin my picture. And again, there is here something about the joy of being photographed. And this picture is often about, well, for me, it's about, it, it's about privilege. Um, privilege and education because um, yeah the the American missions uh, the American missionaries did actually great work to expand uh, schooling in the province and others took their lead um, the other missions and the local schools took their lead um, but it was still something for the privileged um, children's families had to pay fees and they were by local standards quite substantial and it's also about, for me, the privilege of, of photography. Photography we think of as a very free and democratic medium. And um, it really was. It, as technology was improved and as prices fell, it came open to more and more people. And more and more people had the opportunity to have their photographs taken. Um, but it still left many people out. Not, not everyone could afford photographs. And I always think about those those people who are basically left out of the uh, left out of the shots. Again, it's the, those missing elements. And who's to say that this boy had? Who's this boy who's basically barged his way into the picture? Who's to say that he was ever photographed? He'd been photographed before, or indeed was ever photographed again? Um, I think I've hit my time, so I will I will wrap up now. But um, just to quickly think about what does happen next, because Harput is, uh, of course, uh, destroyed in 1915. These pictures that were once conversations across space do become, uh, do then take part in a different kind of conversation. Um, this is the Kubatin family, now safely in Worcester in 1917. Amazingly, they, they now hold up the picture that they'd taken of themselves 10 years previously. Um, this, the ostensible reason is that the father, Havanas, recently passed away just uh, a short while before this photograph was taken. So as once people held up a picture of the absent migrant, they now uh, hold up a picture of the, um, uh, of the deceased. And even though uh, Havana's had died in America of natural causes. I, I think there's no way of the family holding up this picture without understanding, without some thought about where they'd come from, how far they'd traveled, and 
what had happened very recently to their homeland. Um, and a similar picture, we're back in Husseinik. This, this, uh, this is uh, Azniv and Sarkis. Sarkis um, was, uh, these were early migrants to Worcester, Massachusetts, but Sarkis, um, because of the genocide, Sarkis volunteered for French forces and was um, killed in the Ottoman Empire. So uh, his widow, Azniv, commissioned this photograph of themselves, of the two of them. Uh, you may recognize it, it's this photograph that I began with, and just a quick mock-up of, of what's been done by um, K.S. Malikian, who was a, uh, an Armenian from Mizra, who had a studio in um, Worcester and specialized in this sort of thing. Um, and it basically it takes the couple back to their beginnings, to the spring in Husseinik, where the two had met, and basically uh, revives, reunites the two, brings them back together and returns them to their homeland as well. Because actually by this time, Sarkis had been killed and Husseinik had been destroyed. Certainly Serpfava was no more. Um, so I'll quickly wrap up. Uh, pictures that were once the basis of conversations across space become now part of something else. Conversations across time as people look back and attempt to contend with ultimate loss. Um, the note I'll end up on is just to say vestiges of a lost world is what these photographs have, have become for us. And we can't get away from that, and nor should we. But I would like us also to remember, and this may seem a simple point, but it is one that's quite important, I believe, to keep in mind. They were not meant as vestiges. They were not designed as memories. They were products and the tools and the keepsakes of a living world. Objects both precious and part of everyday life. Uh, 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 lives being lived, essentially. They were how people saw their world, navigated the world, and kept their world together. It is by remembering this, by thinking of photographs as, in a sense, living objects that we might talk to and talk about that we might dwell on and contemplate, that we might know and understand the world a little better, the world that they came from a little better, and we might keep that world um, alive a little longer. I'll end there. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, David, thank you so very much. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you so much, David. Um, you know, um, it's uh, I had noticed a little bit of this in your book, but now that I um, uh, was able to kind of uh, hear you present more in terms of a presentation, um, it's it's uncanny to me how many themes and how many points. Um, there's a lot of things you brought up uh, in general about photographs, photography that that I've brought up. Um, in different ways, whether it's in this series or in other things that Project Save has been doing and that I've brought up that have also come up with our other speakers, whether they be photographers, artists, or academics. It's really interesting. Um, I, there are several questions. Um, before I throw out the first question that a few people asked, I do want to uh, welcome uh, Mark Mamigonian uh, to loop him in to this portion, the, the Q&A discussion part, um, and thank uh, Mark uh, and Nasser, once again, for being a co-sponsor uh, for this wonderful uh, event today. Um, uh, the first thing, um, David, I just want, there were a few people that asked if maybe you could talk a little bit about Harpert, Harpert, you know, the region, kind of contextualize the region a little bit for people that might not know as well uh, as much. About yeah, of course. Um, and, um, sorry? No, good. Um, yes, and I, I appreciate I was um, very brief in certain uh, in certain aspects of my talk. So if if anything needs um, elaboration, elucidation, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, Harput is uh, well, yes, it's um, in it's not in the most eastern part of of the empire. Um, it's basically. Um, uh, west of Vaughan, west of um, southwest of Erzurum. So it's um, 
it's it's not uh, it's sort of on the I would say on the outskirts of of what we'd call the the um, uh, that central um, uh, those central those Armenian those old historic um, traditional Armenian homelands. It is um, as I was saying, yeah, it's a place of uh, it was actually um, a place that was was relatively, in many ways, relatively well to do. There was a lot of um, uh, peasant farming there, a lot of um, hand to mouth existence, but it, there was this textile in industry. Um, it, it particularly as the 19th century progressed, it did um, forge these links to the outside world. Its mm -hmm. um, textile industry became world famous and it had many um, very successful local Armenian businessmen. Um, so it was the, as I was saying, it's quite a cosmopolitan place in a way, which is weird because if you look in the map, it's it's almost it's slap bang in the in the middle of um, the sort of uh, the Eastern Empire, and it doesn't present itself as being an obvious candidate for the sort of a cosmopolitan place. But it, um, but the local industry is one thing that helps to turn it into a place with outside connections. Um, that's, as I was saying, that brings uh, the missionaries there. It does have us this, this substantial foreign presence, which again is um, unusual. There are mission sta uh, stations all over the Ottoman Empire, and yet this was probably the one of the strongest and most uh, successful, shall we say, of the um, of the uh, of the mission. Uh, stations and and it does there does um, there is this whole sort of back and forth of Armenians um, traveling and it's sort of the more that it's sort of the more the world is in motion the more sort of uh, Harper changes Harper is is sort of constantly in this dialogue mm -hmm. with the um, with the outside world yeah um, and. It is, it is a place where, it's a special place. It's a place where many diasporic Armenians have their roots. My own, my own family came from, from the plain mm -hmm. and many, many Armenians, particularly in Massachusetts, many Armenians will be able to trace yeah. their roots to, to this yeah, particular yeah. region. Yeah, being, being from Massachusetts and, and Mark also being from, yeah, we can definitely attest to that. And, and also I think there's something about the interest, kind of the intersection, um, you know, it's like Sivas, Diyarbakir, Marash, you know, it, it's uh, where it's located, I think, uh, yeah. Um, Mark, did you, did you want to jump in at all or? I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I thought that was fantastic and I really uh, applaud the the presentation and, and your book and your work in general and I'm so pleased that that we were able to help it in any in any way uh, um, and I think it's I really like how much uh, the work that you're doing and and that a few other people are doing to to study this this photography that was being done in in the uh, Ottoman Empire by Armenians and in this country as well. Uh, it, it's very important academic work, but there's never any loss of the humanity of the of the people in the photographs and the people taking the photographs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I think what I think the scholarship is is catching up to uh, what Project Save actually has been doing for, for a long time. And I think back to, you know, the presentations I saw Ruth Tomasian give decades ago, where she would zoom in on these details in the photographs mm -hmm. and, and, you know, how important it is to remember that these were real people. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I... Mark. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, if I might say it, uh, yeah, uh, at risk of sounding like a stuff record thank you thank you once again for your support it, it, it meant a lot to me and thank you for your kind words uh i yeah that that's in terms of my approach that's always been the at the heart to not to look at these things as the objects of study um but to actually think about them as the product of of 
of lives of real people and people who who yeah that, that world was destroyed and that is uh, uh, an unescapable a huge unescapable part of the story but actually lives the day these people are actually still alive the, through photographs we can actually resurrect something even in the small part we can bring a little something back and it's by actually it is through that approach by actually almost you know speaking to them as equals this conversation now between us and them yeah um, um. and just to say completely agree with what you're saying about scholarship now catching up with the the work that's been done and actually people like myself can only do the work that we we do because of the of the amazing work that's been done by um project save and actually and all the sort of small collections that have contributed to project save project save has photographs because people have saved their pictures because people have rescued their pictures i'm i'm always struck by how photographs survive and they only survive because people have kept them and people have understood their their value and, and because people have kept them we are able now to to look at them um i, I i'm so appreciative uh to both of you and i'm sure right now uh, ruth is watching this and and has um uh, uh, uh tears of, of gratitude is your heart is probably leaping right now um if, if i could just add um to just you're both very thoughtful um and um i i think that you know um for me, um, David, a lot of and Mark, a lot of what what you guys were, were are saying about the humanity, and and also David, you mentioned a few times joy, um, and you know, for me, um, as I as I've taken the reins at Project Save, for me, I, you know, because I'm not an archivist, and although I did work in academia, I was a professor for quite a while, but my I'm really an artist. I'm a poet and I'm a musician, and when I look at the photos at Project Save. Um, or, or other photography in general, especially historical photos. Uh, for me, it, it it's all of those uncanny elements that the materiality of it, the poetry of it, the incredible details in them. Um, as you mentioned, you you look at a photo over and over again, suddenly things start changing and popping up to you that you didn't really notice before, and especially that these were just regular people. Um, we look at these photos now and we think of them as fossilized history, you know, but these were people that just took some photos when they took them. Um, and just the way our photos now um, in this kind of digital deluge, 100, 200, 300 years from now, they're going to look like historical photos, but we're just taking photos. I think that's really important. It humanizes and it reconnects us to the past in a in a in in a more in a more living way for lack of a better word it 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 brings the past to life but it also um illuminates and enlivens our present moment so that we understand that this is a continuum we're all part of that same uh continuum so i really thank you for that that's really important and also the idea that especially in the armenian world when we think of photography as okay you know it's documenting the genocide or that it's only, you know, it's documenting our families and our cousins and this and that. That's all very, very important. But it, but um, I believe, and especially from Project Safe's perspective, at this point, when you have this kind of an archive, you're really documenting just human beings around the world. You're documenting people who are becoming American. These are people in the process of becoming, that they're immigrating to the United States. They're in the Middle East, they're in China, wherever they are. So it's much more dynamic and, and that there's a whole photographic record before the genocide. Um, and that's very important. So um, yeah, um, there are a number of questions I wanna start integrating here. Um, David, um, there was a question about uh, um, the, the kind of, um, you mentioned, and I think you're very correct to mention that idea of, that you know, photography, especially back then, was was a question of privilege, 
not everyone could just have a photograph taken generally. So uh, in terms of the studio, those portraits, or I think like cabinet portraits, are there any thoughts about even sometimes there's the props, there's the backdrop and things like that. Were there ever any times when even the, the, the clothing people are wearing, was that always their clothing? Or were, was there also a question of kind of even sometimes costume, uh, you know, a, 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 port, a portrait studio having certain clothing that they might have the, the subjects wear? Would that ever be, a, was that ever a thing? Um, I haven't seen the, often the that idea of um, dressing up does, we, we tend to find that more in sort of the, the tourist areas, Jerusalem, Constantinople, but, but um, actually that does, that does occur. In fact, um, I'm pluck, uh, plucking something from memory here, but I believe um, Armand Mar Marsubian sent me of the Dildillion archive, a, a yes. photograph from Hubbard, I think from one of the Sorcerian studios, <clears throat> which actually <clears throat> has a note on the, it's, a, it's of a family and has a note on the back about yeah. how they borrowed, um, they're wearing basically Sunday, Sunday best, which was borrowed for the occasion, I think from the, the studio. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because it kind of almost makes sense that maybe that might have happened. So, although, but on the other hand, you know, it's only certain people that could afford those kinds of. That's true. That is true. But but it is also something that, as I say, more and more people were being were able to afford, and or something that people would save up for. So it wasn't it wasn't completely out of reach, mm -hmm. but it was for um, the. For some, it was something that had something very special that had to be saved for, that had to be prepared for. So there are plenty of uh, instances of, of photographs that we know where you know it, it's it, this is the studio being open to the the ordinary folk, as it were. But right. even right. then, these are top in the minority of um, of uh, say the the sort of the, the villagers of the plain, say. Yeah. By the way, I just wanted to mention some some of the comments people are making. I think um, this is the second time, I think, since I've been at Project Save that we, we've co-sponsored something together with Nasser, and I hope we'll do a lot more of, of these. But one of the things is, you know, um, Project Save is focused on photography. But as you all saw, David also mentioned a lot of times uh, the notations, writing on the back of the photos. And I think, Mark, you can maybe speak to this. I think there are also times when you know there's correspondence that sometimes goes along with uh, photographs, and and there there are uh, sometimes we have those at Project Save, but I but I know that Nasser, Mark, you guys I think have a fairly uh, extensive in terms of letters and things like that. Uh, yeah, people well, are interested on the correspondence side of things. I mean, we don't, you know, we aren't, of course, a photo archive. Uh, we Fortunately, there's there is one. Uh, <laughs> but for example, in the Duranian uh, archive that that David uh, used used a number of photos from that, which is focused on Usenig, mm -hmm. and because the Duranian family, two generations, uh, Martyros and 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 uh, Martin, Doctor Martin uh, Duranian, documented their their ancestral community. So along with the photographs they have, in some cases, original photographs, in some cases, copies, there is extensive documentation uh, of, of what the photographs are of who's in the photographs, mm -hmm. not in the same way that you might write on the back of a, of a photo, you know, this was, this is us in our Sunday best or, or, you know, with, with love to, to so-and-so, but um, nonetheless, it, I mean, this sort of documentation is so important because without yeah. it, yeah. So often we're just yeah. left to make guesses. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I think also there's, um, it, it's an example of where organizations like ours, uh, there's plenty of, oh, there's plenty of um, complementary work uh, to be done, you know, um, and, and the way that our resources can be used and the way we can collaborate that then can be useful to folks, um, it would be really good. 
Um, David, I, 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 would add, I would just add, if sure. I can, that um, sure. I think, Arthur, you're completely right. When you talk about, when you sort of, um, you, you put us as part of the continuum about how, you know, often the photos we're looking at, their relationship with to photography was not, not too dissimilar to our relationship to, to photography and how we do things. Often we're doing something very, very similar, but one important difference is the idea of materiality. And we have uh, our generation, uh, those of us now have lost a bit of that connection, that relationship to, to photographs as material object. Right. To the idea of the you know the object to the annotations to all the the letters and the bits that go with it we yeah. we're t we're a little too used now to dealing with screens yeah. and we've there is a bit of distance and we can do yeah. more to to um, get back that idea of of um, of the objects. Yeah, absolutely, David, and and th th thank you. That 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 kind of ties in. A lot of people are asking in the chat about Project Save and how they can donate photos. And uh, just to clarify, you know, th that's that's exactly why I think sometimes I I've come to find out in the last two years since I since I uh, joined Project Save, it turned out that even a lot of our ardent supporters for a long time, for whatever reason, they kind of thought we're a digital archive. And um, that's a very important delineation. It's different to digitize photographs and make them available, like on our website, which, you know, if people go to projectsave.org, they can search, they can, you know, uh, about three or 4% of our photos are, are available to be searched online. But it's very different when uh, we have the actual 80 plus thousand hard copy photographs, that's what's important. That's what's priceless about an organization like Project Save, because uh, as you say, we're, li in, in a, we're living in an age now where, um, and especially uh, unfortunately now, where it's a time when a hundred years later or so, there are yet again, you know, there are forces that would love to kind of erase traces of Armenian culture, our evidence of Armenian, Armenians existing in certain places and so forth. Well, if you, if we were only a digital archive and didn't have these actual the material photographs, then you're you know, who's to say these the, the photographs aren't manipulated uh, digitally? If if all you have is is digital files, you know, there is something to be said for that the precious um, uh, quality of the object itself the, the the artifact itself um and there's also even something about just touching these photos yes. um you know just engaging with them um i think um as you say we've kind of forgotten uh incredibly i mean it really wasn't that long ago but in the last 10 20 years we, we've completely forgotten what it's like to actually hold a, a photograph and feel that very unique connection that exists between the the observer and an actual physical the physical object of the photograph yes to hold to, to hold a photograph in your hands is a completely different experience and it's to you know it, it it fosters a far more intimate relationship with with the with the photograph and with the what the photograph represents the, yeah. the people who are in that picture and it's, By it's the something way, that yeah I, I i'm curious david i mean obviously we we know about the harpert and uh New England connection that that's a pretty uh, uh, strong and kind of you know, robust connection. Do you like have you started noticing or were you noticing or do you know of kind of anything that parallels that with other parts of either North America or parts of Europe or are there any other regions of, of kind of the Ottoman Armenian world and elsewhere I, I think you have some maybe pockets small instances of it but it, 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 it to any substantive degree I, I don't think there's anything that that wow. I've come across that really compares with that um that you know that sizable exodus really of people from from Hartford to to New England and that sort of that connection that bond that that um, then existed for a time um, that's interesting between those two places 
I mean, that, that goes to show then how particularly unique uh, that, co that connection is, that, that kind of specific history is. I believe so. But uh, as always with photographs, there's, there's exciting things out there to be found. Yeah. So who knows what will, uh, yes. what will be uncovered. That's right. That's right. And, and that's the other thing with, with, uh, with, with the photographs at Project Save, with the materials at Nasser, at other, other types of uh, archival organizations. Um, you know, I, I, I always tell people that this is, you know, Project Save is a living archive. It's not a dusty, musty, old archive somewhere, you know, kind of just these relics. Um, it's detective work and folks like yourself, um, um, it's important to, to bring these photographs to life because you don't know where the dots are gonna connect. Um, that's why it's important to preserve, to save these photographs and to share them because we, you know, we might not know, but then suddenly somebody sees it on our website or elsewhere, or it comes up in a talk and, and suddenly there's a whole new life that's brought to, to a group of photographs. Um, yeah. Um, there's a question here about uh, marriage. Um, you mentioned a few times about that, that there were a lot of uh, uh, marriage related uh, in terms of the migration, in terms of the connection between the Harpert and New England. Can you maybe talk a little bit, like how much of that did you find where there was some kind of a marriage proposal or long distance type of relationship or or anything like that? Yeah, that does seem to be quite a um, a strong strand of picture making that um, uh, that once um, Armenian communities became this uh, more established. That, mm -hmm. um, but as I was saying, it it is it's basically men of working age uh, traveling. But um, then these these relationships. Um, form uh there there there's a phenomenon no a famous phenomenon known as the picture brides these are specifically relationships marriages which have been ar arranged through photographs mm -hmm. um so you have um photographs either sort of connecting existing loved ones a, a man will leave behind his his fiance say and, and photographs will keep them together or you you have in many cases Two people who've never met before and only know each other through photographs. There's a whole sort of courtship and arrangement through families and through the exchange of photographs. Um, and when, when I when I mentioned the idea of um, photographs, migrant photographs, um, leaving things out and not being calculated lies, there are unfortunately. <laughs> The instances of calculated lies are there are stories of um say older men who you know present pictures of you know send pictures of younger men in, in an effort to um <laughs> to entice young brides to america These oh the my instances God. It's, come across it's on, almost like on, the or, original catfishing or something so, <laughs> so yes it is um wow but but um, no, Ar Armenian migrants tended to, uh, they wanted to sort of sustain and solidify Armenian communities and they would marry, Ar Ar Armenian migrant men would marry Armenian women who would often follow them from, mm. from the homeland, follow them perhaps from the, the very same village mm. and um, join them in, in the US. It's you know I was wondering and maybe Mark you 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 might you know uh, also being a, a native uh, a Bostonian and a New Englander I'm 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 just thinking I wonder if uh, do you think maybe uh, David that because in in Harper there was such a, a missionary presence um, and I'm thinking about how vibrant and. Uh, strong the Armenian community has been in, in New England and that connection to Harbert and New England being, you know, quite a obviously historically connected to uh, England and, and having a kind of Protestant work ethic and things like that. I wonder if that there's something to that, 
You, you know what I'm saying? These Armenians ended up in New England, and it, it's it it has such a history of such a being a, such a vibrant, productive uh, community. I wonder if that element is part of that, where they they've already come here with a certain. Um, th they have that general kind of immigrant work ethic that that all immigrants tend to have. But I wonder if there's that little extra, you know, Protestant work. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. As a, it, um, yeah, it's I mean, hard to many, know what many, was the... Go ahead, David. Well, I was just going to say, yes, there, there were many attached to the Protestant church. But of course, once Armenian communities were established, it, it, they weren't necessarily... Um, Protestants or connected sure, to of course, the right. Church, Church. So, but but yes, there there was there was a uh, at least the beginning to set the ball rolling. There was a, a, a distinct Protestant stand, uh, strands to to those migratory movements. Right. Yeah, I was just wondering what what whether what was the cause and what was the effect. There was a sort of sense of the Armenians, you know, uh, among some of the missionaries saw them as the quote unquote Yankees of the East, uh, you know, with all that might go with that phrase. Uh, and, yeah. and you know, and that Armenians sometimes like to depict themselves in those terms, that they that they were the Yankees of the East and they had the the, right. the American work ethic and, and, <laughs> and all that. So yeah. whether they they were it was a common whether they were common values or whether it was emulating uh, a, a, a notion that was being projected on them is right. an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, David, someone in the comments mentioned that I guess uh, there's also a fairly large Harper Armenian community in Lyon, uh, in in France. Are you aware of other pockets of? The, um, that... Some other pockets, but I, I have to profess ignorance. Not ones I know a great deal about. So I'm yeah. sorry to report. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, as we kind of start to wrap up, Mark, did you anything you wanted to throw in or add or anything before we? Well, I was wondering, and David, you might know the answer to this. Whether since Greeks were uh, highly involved in in photography in the Ottoman Empire as well, are there similar studies being carried out uh, of? Uh, Greek photographers in the Greek diaspora in the same period? Not my, I've only read small, tiny bits here and there, nothing substantial. I'm not, so not, not that I'm aware of, but, it, the, but quite possibly someone to work on it. And there is, yeah, there is a, a great study to be done of, yeah, because you, you often find Greeks, um, you you find Armenia is more in the interior in the Armenian yeah. homelands, but yeah. but head head north to the Black Sea and the studios are populated by Greek photographers, or uh, head westwards to Smyrna, Izmir. The you know there were you know lots of Greeks in that region. So um, yeah, certainly there's there's a, a a great history to be be written there of of Greek photographers in the Ottoman. <laughs> And you know what's interesting, Mark, about that is um, something else I didn't know until until I joined Project Save. Um, somehow, unbelievably, there there is no equivalent of Project Save in any other American kind of uh, immigrant community. In other words, there are, of course, there are collections, let's say, of Italian American photography, or, uh, but they're usually part of a museum, or they're part of some other kind of institute. There, There is no, or at least not that I know of, there might be one or two small, but I, and Ruth is unaware either. Of, um, and that's been really interesting, because uh, now that Project Save is doing more public facing things, and we're reaching out a lot more, we are getting a lot of attention and interest from folks just from other, eth eth I don't want to say ethnic, I mean, we're all ethnic, but from other kind of immigrant communities who are just interested in kind of that social history or the, the history of immigration to the United States. And they're also kind of hungry for their own. They're trying to understand the, the, their own pattern of migration. But it's, 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 I was kind of shocked that um, there isn't, um, 
you know, I thought there would be maybe like an Italian American photography archive or, but there really aren't. There are just these pockets of collections that are part of other types of uh, collections. Uh, but uh, uh, David, I, I had a question for you, um, kind of more on a personal note. What, what is it that, um, this is someone I ask, something I ask of, of all of our speakers. For you, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't finished your book completely, but the parts I've read and other articles I've read, I feel, and for, especially from now hearing you speak, I feel like there's something kind of personal in it for you. There's some kind of personal in, investment um, can you maybe talk a little bit about that? What, how, where your interest in all of this came from and uh, why it's important to you? Um, it's, there is certainly a personal investment. Um, uh, my, yeah, my, my family are from, uh, my mum's family came from the Harper of the Plain. So okay. this is the work I do, I do feel is a part of sort of family history, even though they don't feature in it, it's, I think part of what I do is is try to understand my own my own history, where my family came from, um, and this is certainly some a desire I've I've always been in I was always interested in photography, and what I really wanted to do was was read about Armenians and photography, and there didn't seem to be much work done, so I, I thought that this this was a, a subject I had to um, tackle for myself, and it, it's. It is, it is in part a, a, a personal. Um, it, it is in part personal research, even though, as I say, the the personal doesn't really feature in it. But but uh, everything I when I when I conduct this research and when I read and when I write, I find I'm sort of learning a little bit more about about my own family's past and filling in the blanks. And uh, as I was trying to say understanding that world uh, a little better yeah yeah thank you um I, I just want to wrap up by by uh thanking uh dr david lowe for such a wonderful uh, uh talk uh, today it's just really insightful and and really energizing and and it's so much to think about i, I hope we can do something like this again uh soon um, and uh, Mark uh, Mamigonian, uh, Director of Academic Affairs at Nasser. Thank you so much, Mark, for, for co-sponsoring this. Um, I hope we get to do more stuff together. Um, and there were a number of uh, questions and comments ab about Project Save. I just want to let it, I, I wanted to just say it so that everyone can, uh, instead of answering each one, um, uh, uh, go to our website, projectsave.org. Um, you can get in touch with me or just email uh, the, the general email archives at projectsave.org uh, um, about donating uh, photographs. Um, as you can see from this talk, from, from the other <laughs> talks that we have, it's very, very important uh, to preserve uh, photographs, um, not just photographs, but um, in our case, uh, photographs, because again, you just don't know when or how those photographs are going to come to life. And when that happens, uh, the subjects in the photos are, they're also coming to life. They're, they're not really gone. Um, they're there. Um, um, so it's very important uh, to, to preserve them and to share them, talk about them. So reach out to us and we can uh, talk to you about that. Um, some of you uh, also asked a lot of questions because, of course, there was a big Harper connection in New England. So a lot of you had questions about your families and cousins and all that good stuff. Um, that isn't really something that Project Save does. What I would suggest um, is uh, reaching out to people like George Aljayan, um, who is based out of the Hydenic Association in, in Watertown, Massachusetts. George does a lot of work that's more on the genealogy side of things. Um, so I, I would definitely reach out to him. Of course, you're, you're welcome to reach out to us. We'll do the best we can to kind of uh, channel your question uh, to the right place. Um, Lastly, uh, um, our next two speakers coming up are uh, Ada Oshagan, a photographer and artist, Ada Oshagan from Los Angeles. Uh, he'll be doing our conversations on photography next month. You'll, we'll send out a notice about that. And then the, I'm pretty sure I think in June or maybe July, but I think it'll be in June, uh, Zeynep Gursel, who's an anthropologist at Rutgers University. 
and who does a lot of work also on, on photography and, and the Ottoman Empire. All of the conversations on photography, including this one, um, they are uploaded to the Project Save website, projectsave.org, and they're also on our YouTube channel. Um, please support us whatever way you can. We can't do this work without all of your help, um, so we appreciate that. And please also visit uh, nasser.org, check out all the wonderful work that they're doing, all the wonderful events that they're having as well. Thank you all so much, David. Thanks again uh, for your time. I know it's late over there. Really appreciate it. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arthur and Project Save. And thank you, Mark and Nessa. It's It's been a great pleasure. Cheers. Thanks, great. everyone. Thanks, Good Mark. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.